and that's actually a good thing. Okay, so so I want to go through a lot of options for um, for modeling uh, more complex geometry in Revit, and I'm going to work up to this um, uh, curved uh, spiral stair balustrade, which uh, you'll see. Uh, so there, that's just put back the um, the wall that I've put on to make the solid balustrade. And so you'll see if you search for this online, it's something that a lot of people have been uh, trying to do since about 2008. I've actually seen in a lot of the forum posts I've searched that uh, people have been trying to get this to work since then. And I saw there was a big bunch of posts on the Autodesk forum in around 2016. Uh, a bunch of guys who were really good with Revit, I think, um, have been trying to get this, this particular sort of balustrade to work and, and weren't able to do it. And these were Revit experts. They were pretty good with most things, but um, but again, they just could not get this geometry to work. And, uh, and I think the reason they couldn't get it to work is that they were using, trying to use the, uh, well, there are two methods, either the stringer option. So you can go and change the size of the stringer and effectively use that as a, as a balustrade. And it kind of works. For balustrades that don't have a landing, oh, sorry, for spiral stairs, sorry, that don't have a landing, it works fairly well. But even with that method, there are issues because you can see here, just because of the nature of the geometry, when you have a helix that um, projects a rectangular profile, which is what you can see here on this balustrade, um, you can see there on both sides at the top, now we've got a different shape. And again, it's just the nature of the geometry because you've got a tighter radius with this helix on the inside uh, than on the outside. Uh, you end up with that, um, that different section coming from the profile. Uh, so in other words, we have two different rectangles now at the top. So it's not really a feasible option, I think, if you want real um, control over um, the way your balustrade turns out, because of course you want the, the top point of that railing or balustrade to be the same at the top of the stair as it is at the bottom. So, so again, I don't think that method really works. Um, the other method using a railing, uh, you might have seen when I did some demos in class, that turns out even more strangely. And I've experimented a lot with this. You can get some things to work, but I think, again, it's not really a feasible option. So instead, I'm going to show you some options with massing. But again, I thought it's a good chance to also go over the, um, the wall modeling tools. So I'm going to switch back to my file uh, that, uh, that I've set up that's a bit more, um, a bit more basic, actually. But, uh, but again, I can then set some things up from scratch in here without messing with um, uh, Hinnico's design, which uh, which I actually do like, but uh, but again, I just want to have something that's um, a bit simpler. So here I've got this file that I've been working on, and so I might just start over here with some some walls. And I know this is what uh, some of you have already worked out already. That well, firstly we'll start with the wall tool. So with the wall tool, if you want to make uh, curving walls, of course you have the option to use uh, arcs using the regular wall tool. But notice there is no option to make other kinds of curves, except for ellipses. So technically an ellipse is not an arc, an ellipse is a segment of a, um, well it's a, it, it's almost like a spline based curve, uh, I'm sure you all have an idea what an ellipse is. Um, and uh, so it doesn't have a consistent radius, it actually needs two radiuses. Uh, but it's not quite going to give you all the options that a spline would. Uh, but apart from the ellipse tool, uh, again, otherwise, all you have with uh, the wall tool is the option to use the arc tool. Uh, so I'll just show you again if you haven't um, used these. So we then your um, start, end, center, the first arc tool there. Uh, sorry, start, end, radius. Sorry, Not start, end, center. Um, so that, of course, gives you the option to create an arc that way. Clicking on the two ends first and then the radius afterwards. I can maybe show a couple of little options that you have there uh, just to maybe finish off with that because I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with this uh, wall tool and you have all, I'm sure, drawn arcs before as well. But again, we can look at a couple of little things there. If you have a um, an arc that you draw and, uh, and make a full semicircle, that works a little bit differently to one that you make that isn't a semicircle, so you can see there I'm, I'm giving it a larger radius. And so now if I go to adjust this one, I can, oops, sorry, just trying to drag that there. So I can 
So just tabbing here. Uh, sorry, there we are. Okay, so you can see there I'm changing the, uh, the curve and it's um, changing the radius. And what I might do actually is draw some other walls, uh, just straight walls at the end so you can see how it works a bit differently. Okay, so then if I draw walls connected to this one, Okay, so now again, if I change the radius of uh, this wall, just make it 2000, you can see that it keeps the, the tangent, in other words, basically, it keeps a smooth um, join from the, the curve to the straight wall because I've drawn this one as a semicircle. Whereas this one, if I change the radius, you can see that the two straight walls didn't move because it doesn't try to keep that tangent connection. In other words, it's not trying to keep a smooth connection between the straight wall and the, uh, and the curved wall. Uh, now, if I do get it to be a tangent, so I'll just try dragging it out. It's quite difficult, but I should be able to do it. Yeah, so there we are. Sometimes it's a bit fiddly, but there we are, that's what. So now you can see I've snapped to make it a tangent. In other words, a smooth connection. And, uh, and then now, if I adjust that wall, uh, it'll again keep those joined. So just those little things when you're drawing arcs that you've got to got to look at. But it's still really important that you're aware of that option because uh, you can do a lot with um, with arcs. And I know you all probably want to start to look, to look at splines, and I'll get onto splines in a minute. But uh, actually, what I might do is draw a spline just so you know what I'm what I'm getting at. So I'm just going to draw a spline using a detail line. Because again, I know if you're trying to be creative and you want to have a more organic sort of design, which is good, I, I try to do this quite often. So you might have something where you want to curve something like this. And the spline tool is great for that. And it can be done very much before. You have these handles that you can use to then adjust the curve. And that's great. You should be aware that this is not really buildable. A builder can't be given dimensions to create a curve like this. And so, so the reason it's very important to understand uh, how arcs fit into the whole building and design and construction process is that um, arcs are, are buildable. So if you have a spline sort of shape like this and then using the, the wall tool, you can go over it with arcs and you might just need a series of arcs and you should be able to get something very close to that spline. So I'm doing it quickly. I could do it a bit slower than this and get it even closer. But you can see already, just by doing, you know, several arcs, you will get something very close to the um, the spline that you might be uh, basing it on. And if you look at how it's snapping, you can see there it's snapping to the tangent again. And so when you get that tangent snap, it will give you a nice smooth join. Okay, so that's all with arcs. And hopefully you can see uh, or, or understand that with an arc, you can... Uh, give that information to a builder right? because you can give the builder the start point and the end point of the arc and then the radius of the arc and and they can set it out on site and 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 build the thing so that's uh, that's a great option and so I'm just coming back to check just let me know if I don't if I miss any chats because I'm uh, I'm on a different screen uh, when I'm in Revit but uh, yes yeah, so I just quickly checking that okay so yeah so continuing on uh, that's that's a good thing to think about. If you can get the, uh, the shape you want with arcs, it's uh, better for construction. It's also easier to adjust. So you might see again, if you've tried using the spline tools, that, uh, so again, I'm just gonna draw another spline. We'll come to splines with, uh, uh, with actual walls in a moment, but I'm just gonna put another spline with a detail line just to show you some of the limitations because, you know, I don't dislike splines. I use them all the time in, in uh, other programs, I use them constantly. But with Revit, I always am a bit hesitant to use them, or I try to avoid them if I can, just because of the limitations that you have. So here again, I've got two splines, and now I might want to join those two. So I'll go to the Trim tool. I can't choose the splines. Offset, we'll try that again. You can offset a spline, but when you offset a spline, 
the one that you've created in that tool isn't adjustable. So the first one, you can see there, I've still got the handles, I can adjust that. The second one isn't. Uh, so, so you have some limitations using the spline tool in Revit. Uh, but again, if you have uh, something that's traced over your spline and done with arcs, so I'll just put in another wall over here. Right, so I might have a another arc based wall that I then want to join. Okay, so now I can use the trim tool and join those two walls together. Even though I've done it the wrong way, so I'll just do that again. Okay, so I'll just try picking it a bit further down. Okay, so, and then also you've got the option, I don't know if you've tried it, but if you want to join <laughs> two walls uh, with a curve in between, the, you've got the fillet arc tool, so a lot of you might know in AutoCAD, the fillet tool gives you the option to create um, uh, a radius or a curve between uh, two elements, usually two lines, but it could be two, two curves as well. So in Revit, if you haven't seen that tool, it might have been because you're looking for it on the on the modify tab, and you have uh, again all those tools that you have in AutoCAD in uh, modify. So move, copy, rotate, and so on. But the fillet tool doesn't live there in Revit. So in Revit, they consider the fillet tool to be a, a drawing tool. So you get that when you uh, again creating things, and with the wall tool or any other tool, uh, it comes up in the the draw panel. And so there again, we've got fillet arc, and Okay, so you can put a radius in in advance if you tick radius, or you can pick the two things that you want to join and then try and get the radius to work. Now, the problem with this is that you can't always get a radius between uh, everything that you pick. So you can see there, it's not really giving me the right radius because uh, it would be very difficult to have a curve between these two things. But maybe I'll just show you with two longer walls. It does work very well normally. Uh, where it's possible. So again, just trying to give you options for making curves. And so I'm just going to draw a wall over here. Oh, sorry, that's, that's me being stupid. So I'll start that again. Okay, so I'll just put the wall here and then another one. It can be a curve or straight, doesn't matter. Um, curves actually work really well uh, with uh, fillet radius normally. Okay, so I've got two walls there and now I want to put a curve between them. Let's maybe make it so they're not touching, just to make it a bit easier. Okay, so again, back to now to fill it up while I'm making a wall. I can choose those two walls and this one. Here we go, moving the cursor. You still need to move the cursor around sometimes to see the options, but I saw it there. There it was. There we are. Okay, so that's the curve that I'll get once I click. So I'll click now to put that radius between them. And then again, we get a nice smooth join between those walls. So you've got lots of options for making curved walls just using the wall tool. But if you want to go a bit further and create things that you can't make with arcs, then of course, as I think some of you have tried, you can use Model in Place. Now I'm going to go on, I might maybe even do a second video on um, using the massing option, which is really what I want, want to get to. But I'll start off with the um, the walls option. So make sure you're aware when you choose a category here, what you're really choosing is a set of tools. So if I choose the walls option here, I'm going to get certain tools for modeling using extrusions. Uh, how do we curve an already nibbed wall? Uh, so what do you mean by nibbed? So is that, oh, Christy, yeah, so Christy, yeah, so, so when you say nib wall, the yeah, little so structural you know walls. Yeah, so supporting um, little walls that come out. I just want to know how I can curve that instead of it just being... Oh, you mean curving it in elevation, not in plan? Is that what yes. you mean? Yes. Yeah, sure, sure. So you need to model that? Yeah, so I'll show you that. Yeah, I'll do, a, I'll do, yeah, I'll do an example with that. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so so again, and, and so for that, we would probably use this option. So model in place and then choose the walls category. Click OK. 
and you know as I've been saying it's up to you if you give a name here uh, I usually do but sometimes I don't worry so it's it's really for you to know um, what you've uh, what you've made and uh, and to be organized so here I can remember that what I'm making is called walls one so I'll just click OK and then we'll get the solid modeling tools so I'm actually glad you mentioned that uh, that option for for the nib wall because that means we'll need to look at using um, a different plane to do our modeling but I'll start off with um, modeling in the same plane that I've been working in, just in the ground plane. So now I'll go to make an extrusion. And you'll see here now, you do have the option to make a spline. Okay, so I can go and click on that and I'll go and then make a, uh, a shape inside. So I've done here some of these before, showing you the other modeling tools. So that was a blend, I think. Uh, but those were, some of them were using splines, but most of them were using arcs. So maybe just over here, we'll do, uh, let's say it's an insertion where I want some sort of molded um, material. And again, drawing the spline, we can of course make that little curve we like. So let's try and go around this thing. So you might have seen in the demo I did last year, I did something very similar. So this is all on, on the YouTube videos already. Okay, so notice I've just drawn the part that I needed to with the spline tool. And then where I can, so in other words, alongside the existing wall there, uh, going into the corner, that can of course be straight lines. So there's no problem doing parts with the spline and then doing other parts with other tools. So here I can just go and draw a line and then bring that back around. Like so. Okay, so then just like normal with an extrusion, we need to give a height. So I'll make that 3000 or so. And then um, tick to finish. So that's a very simple example of modeling with a spline. And because it's a solid, we can of course use voids and subtract from that um, as normal. But I probably don't need to go into that. I'm sure you're all comfortable with those things. Uh, and so I might just finish that model and then we can quickly look at that in, um, in perspective. I can maybe remind you about some of the issues you'll have with materials because we really need to get onto materials and lighting and I wanted to hopefully uh, look at that later today. So here you can see again just in the camera view, got a realistic so you can see that there's no material there. So I just wanted to remind you, I know we've gone over a lot of these things before but it's a, it's a very common mistake that people make um, at any stage and, um, and uh, I've seen even people who use, have used Revit for many years uh, have this, this very common issue. When you use model in place to make something and then you come back to assign materials later, like I have now, you can see I've selected it and then there won't be a material property. And then you can look over here in properties, if you can see my cursor there. And then if you go to edit type, again, no material option. There is a structure material parameter there, but it won't do anything. So. Okay, so that's not the way you assign materials when you've used model in place. What you need to do instead is go to edit in place once you've selected what you've made and then select it again. Now you might think, why do I have to select that thing again when I already had it selected? But if you're wondering, the reason it's like that is because you may have multiple extrusions or other things that you've modeled. So maybe I'll just quickly make something else. So I'll make another uh, random extrusion. Let's put a box there in front of the camera. Make it a thousand, let's say. And well, actually, let's make it a bit interesting. And so I'll do a little jewelry display cabinet or something. So let's make it, uh, let's say, 600. Or oh, no, let's go for 500. And I'll make it square because I'm fussy and I want it to be even. Okay, so I've made my little box. And then a little trick that I could quickly show you. Oh, 
Oh, changing their, yeah, good point. Okay, so, yeah, that's a really good question. So, okay, so you can change your category. Once you've made something, if you start with generic models, you can change to most other categories. So to change the category of something you've modeled uh, midstream, you need to be editing it, as I am now. And then you have this option up here, family category and parameters. So click on that. And then you can change it to other parameters. Okay, so yes, that's a really good point because now, watch out though, ceilings uh, have some limitations. You can go from generic to ceiling, but I know what you're probably thinking. Can you go from nursing to ceiling? Because there are limitations with Revit. You can make almost any shape you like, any 3D shape with walls and roofs and floors. They can do almost anything. But ceilings, unfortunately, and I hate this with Revit, I wish they'd fix it, but at the moment with ceilings, there are massive limitations in what you can model. So lots of really complex shapes. And I know you, you want to do this with ceilings. You have to do them as roofs or, or floors even. Uh, yeah, because you'll see if you make it with a mass, you cannot change it to a ceiling. But you can go from generic model to ceiling. So try it out. It'll tell you if it can't work. So here, I'll just show you. If I try to change it to mass, it'll tell me I can't do that. But if I try to change it to from walls to generic models, it will let me. And I can go back the other way from generic models to walls. So experiment with that. There are lots of uh, good options there, but uh, yeah, I know you might have been thinking what I've thought as well, which you can get, which is that you get a mass to, into a ceiling, and unfortunately, uh, you can't. But maybe in future, I know they're looking at it. Um, yeah, but that's a really good question. So then, continuing on with this um, with this box, uh, another great little trick I thought I'd show you, which I use all the time. If you really think about what you can do with this trick, you'd be amazed how productive it can make you. So all I'm going to do is with that extrusion selected, go to copy place and then paste a line to same place. Right, so I've got a duplicate now of the original box sitting on top of the previous one. And then I'm just going to change the extrusion start to 300. Come on, wake up. I oh, know what am I saying? Not 300, sorry, that's me being stupid. 1300. Okay, so I've just brought the box up. So it saves me making a new extrusion on top of the previous one. And if you take, I mean, I've done massive things like this uh, where I've had, you know, several different, slightly different variations on an initial shape. And you can just knock them out very quickly by using that option to paste over the original. It saves you making something again that's, you know, very similar. And then you can adjust some parameters and often get something that's, that's quite different. So then it might make it a bit clearer why you need to assign materials in this way because if I didn't have the option to go and select each extrusion separately, of course I wouldn't be able to set different materials to those things. So that's why you need to select edit in place to then go and select the different things you've modelled. And so you can see I've done that, I've selected my extrusion that's for the glass sitting on top of my base. And now I'm simply going to assign the glass material to that. So then the base, uh, I'll, I can make a different material, of course, and I'll just make that maybe a plain finish. So if you're not using that finish material, it's a really good one to um, start using because it's in uh, all of your template files and it's basically an off-white plaster type material that's uh, preset. I find it's a little bit warm to begin with, so you can always go adjust that color and make it a bit lighter, also a bit um, maybe a bit whiter and, uh, and cooler. But that's up to you. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so then, of course, we can see that, and so then I can make a new material maybe for the um, the wall that I modeled behind. So again, we'll go to um, select it, which I can do, of course, because I'm editing my model and then again I can go and uh, maybe make a material and so I think here we can just quickly go over that I know you've all made materials before and uh, so I'm sure you know about the option to duplicate by right clicking on a material and then go to the appearance tab and either duplicate or replace uh, so make sure you're comfortable with that option I thought just because we maybe haven't done, 
So, done very much with this option down the bottom. I'd quickly go over that. <coughs> Sorry. So, clicking on the little sphere there at the bottom. Then you can go to create new material. So, you'll then get a brand new material called default new material. Right click and then you can rename it. <coughs> so, I'll call this um, wood <coughs> wall. And notice here, I don't need to <coughs> change the appearance because this one isn't shared. So when it says zero there, it means it's not shared by any other materials. Um, but I'm going to go back to graphics and then just hit use render appearance and still just go through the normal process I do. Uh, again, graphics um, doesn't need to have a lot of settings if you don't, uh, if you don't need that. So by ticking use render appearance, then uh, we're going to pick the color out from the appearance tab. But now, even though this isn't linked, I'm still going to replace it because I want to get the appearance library uh, or the asset browser. So I'm going to right click there and go to replace. And then go to the appearance library folder. So hopefully you're getting used to that. It's the only one that's really useful here. The other folders are all for engineering and thermal analysis and things like that, which you don't need to worry about. So again, appearance library and then wood. And I'll just get one of these wood materials. Birch, something's fine. Okay, so again, just very quickly going over materials, but hopefully you're all comfortable with that. But it also gives me a chance to point out some of the changes with um, with Revit. Well, this actually came through in Revit 2019, but it's continuing with Revit 2020. That the material templates have changed. So just be aware of that. You don't really need to be expert with all the different settings in the different templates. But uh, again, if you're aware of it, then uh, it'll make it easier uh, to well, to understand why you have different settings sometimes. And so here, this is actually not technically a wood material. It has different settings. Just so you know what I mean, I'll switch over and just show you another wood material. So you can see that one is called wood. So that is using the wood appearance template but again with the newer versions of Revit they've brought in yet more templates which are uh, technically better but they're also more complex and uh, well if you if you like physics and, and you want to get into it it's uh, it is more physically correct but, uh, again, sometimes working with things like emissivity and um, uh, some of these highlight controls uh, it's Again, it's, it's a more physics-based approach, so it can be a little bit more difficult. So remember, if you see this option and uh, you're not sure what some of these controls do, you always have the option to right-click on appearance and then duplicate as generic. So that puts it back to the old generic template. You can see there it says generic. So the settings that you have there are the standard ones that you get with all the old materials. And you get all the options that are maybe more relatable, like reflectivity, transparency, and so on. So I just want to quickly point that out. There have been a few changes behind the scenes with materials in Revit that are easy to miss. Otherwise, though, the process is, is fairly similar to what we've been doing before to make them. So you can see there now I've got my wood material uh, coming up really clearly. And it's on a spline, which is a great thing. So that works. So you can make complex curves that way. And uh, again, using model in place, you can make a flat spline. Okay, again, so as long as you use model in place and choose the wall category, you'll get those solid modeling tools, extrusion, blend, uh, sweep, and revolve, essentially, which do all give you the option to make splines. Then just taking it a little bit further. Uh, again, back to model in place. So the more powerful option is to use mass as the category. So again, I'll uh, click OK. And you'll get this message if you haven't turned your massing visibility on. It'll basically tell you that it's turning on. You don't have any choices here. This is just information. And if you read it, you'll, t you'll, you'll see it's actually telling you that it's got this temporary um, display mode just for massing. 
So I'm going to hit close and maybe just show you, uh, or firstly I'll just click OK for the name and then just show you if you haven't done massing before, there's a really important uh, option you need to know about. So uh, I'm actually going to cancel this just so that I can show it to you. So it's on the massing and site tab. You have this button where you can click on the down arrow to choose the two different options. Don't worry about the two grayed out ones. They're not clickable at the moment. So it's just two options at the top. So the one with the, um, the floor plates and the little light bulb there, that's show mass. And the other one that's show mass by view settings, which really at the moment means don't show the mass. So don't want to go too far with this, but essentially you have view settings uh, in your visibility options where you can have mass ticked or unticked. Now by default it's unticked. So when it's unticked, essentially um, this first option means uh, that the mass will turn off. And then, yes, uh, oh, Tanya might have taken, Tanya must have taken them back to the... Um, oh, right, right, yeah, so she would have taken it back to um, Robin's office. Yeah, it's uh, they the same ones that I used yesterday. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah they should. Yeah, so Kate is one of them all in one place, I think. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, okay, so the uh, yeah, so it's the second option there that we want normally when we're working with massing because that means massing will be visible no matter what. And and also just be aware if you're going to use massing, when you close your file and then open it again, it'll always be set to this first option, which means again it may be not visible. Uh, even though it was when you closed your file. Uh, and so then all you need to do again is go to Massing and Site and click on this button to show it again. So I might just go over and quickly make a mass so that's a bit clearer. So I'll just go back to, again, Model in Place and then choose Mass. Okay, we just make sure it's clear to you as well if you're going to try some massing. You can go to the Massing and Site tab and choose In Place Mass. And that does exactly the same thing, but just skips the step of um, getting you to choose the mass category. It just it just does that for you, but it does exactly the same thing. So, so again, I'll cancel that. So either massing insight and choose in place mass or architecture component model in place, and then again choose mass for the category. It does the same thing. Okay, so again, finally I'll click OK for the name. And so I might just start with a very simple mass. So I'll draw a rectangle. And then go to a 3D view so that you can see. Oops. Okay, so at the moment it's just a flat shape on the ground. So we're, I'm going to be doing a lot with uh, these flat profiles or shapes. Uh, and they do, uh, they are useful just as, as shapes like that. But just so you have an idea, you haven't seen much of massing before. The way massing uh, generally works is that you start with a shape like this and then use this create form tool to make a solid shape. And so I've done that and it's giving me a box now. And I can use these little arrows to stretch it. And this is where you maybe see where massing is a bit more powerful than. Uh, the solid tools because uh, I can, of course, lift it up and down the top, but I can also take it left and right or forwards and backwards. So that's effectively something you could only get with a blend uh, using the other tools. So I've got my very basic little mass thing. I'll go to finish mass. So again, just want to show you with the massing and site tab. Now, if I click on this button, uh, so let's, uh, I'll save it. Okay, there we are. Okay, so it's disappeared. If I click on that button again, it comes back. Okay, so now if you go into the view settings, you can make it stay on permanently but uh, but again if it's not ticked in that option you have to use this one 
Uh, so again, if I was to close the file, it would be like this. And I just have to go to massing and site when I first open the file and then click on this to see the massing again. Um, and again, once you get used to it, it's actually a pretty good system. So I've got that mass, I'll leave uh, just to the side and then I'll come back and make something different. So again, using model in place, and then mass. And I'll just leave this. Yes, this is good to use for sculptural pieces. Absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly what it's used for. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really powerful. Um, you can do um, yeah, almost anything with this. Tool. So, so again, I'm back to the massing um, tools. I might go to the floor plan just so it's easier to see uh, what I'm drawing. Okay, so again, I can draw a spline. Okay, now, I can, of course, offset that spline to give it some thickness and then uh, join the ends to make a closed shape. And then I could extrude that using create form as you might normally if you were to make an extrusion. So I might just show you that. Uh, I'll just copy this to the side. Okay, so if I was to offset it, give it a thickness. All right, so that's the thickness of my wall, and then I can just cap the ends off with lines. And just, just so you're aware, I'm showing you this so you know how not to do it, because this is a common mistake people make when they use massing. They think that you're using massing to create the geometry that you want in the end. And that's not really what it's for. So here, if I now select that shape, you can see it's all joined together. It's a closed shape. And if I click Create Form, it'll extrude it. And I get my solid looking wall. Now, that might be fine in, in some cases, but I know, because I've tried it, if you try to put textures onto this wall, they won't map correctly. So you do all this great work to do some really beautiful complex models and then find that you can't really use them for rendering unless you use a lot of workarounds because again the textures aren't mapped correctly uh, essentially because massing isn't really meant to be used this way. It's not meant for the geometry that you're, the things you're building. Uh, so, so again that's not the way I recommend you use massing. If you absolutely have to, it is possible as a workaround to get the geometry you want that way, but again, it's not the preferred option. So what you really need to start thinking about with massing is how to use it to generate other geometry. And that's that's what I'm trying to show you. So, so instead of making that, um, that solid shape, what I'm going to do instead is simply select the single spline that I drew and then use that create form tool. Right, so you can see there, you can extrude single shapes. They don't need to be closed shapes. And that's why I think a lot of people make a mistake when they're coming from uh, solid modeling and used to making closed shapes all the time so that they can extrude them. Um, don't always realize that you can extrude anything with mass. <laughs> so it doesn't need to be a closed shape. And it's a brilliant option because it opens up a lot of possibilities for modeling with you. So if you Again, I'll just draw some lines over here just to give you some more examples. Okay, so I can just draw lines like this. So again, I can just select those lines. Create form. And I've got some surfaces. You might think, well, they're not very useful because they're just flat surfaces. But what I'm going to do now is finish the mass and then show you the, what are called the, well, yeah, how do you make them thicker? That's what I'm going to do now. That's right. So there's this suite of tools. They used to be really clearly labeled as the building uh, building maker tools or something in the older versions, but now it's just under mass size. size. It's, called, it's under model by face. So this is why I was saying you can't really use this to get things like ceilings because 
there's no option for that. But you've got walls, floor, and roof as options that you can use with model by face. So now if I go to wall, and then I've got all my regular wall types. Here we are, once they come up, there we are. Okay, so I can choose any of those wall types. And then simply pick that surface. Okay, so hopefully that will maybe give you uh, a lot of options, even with flat shapes. I'll go on to, um, I think I can do it in this video, so ones that curve away from the from the plane. So, so again, but even with flat things, you can do amazing things. And um, so I'll uh, again show you here. So you might think, well, that's a wall you could just draw. So why would you worry about using massing for this? So I can, of course, go to wall now and then just, again, as long as it's on pick faces, which it is, I can pick those faces and then get my walls. But again, nothing special because I can do that with the wall tool. So let's go back. So I'm just undoing, there we go. Okay, so I need to select that mass and go to, oh sorry, I'm still on uh, pick faces. So I'll just cancel that. Okay, so I'll select that mass and then go back to edit in place. Show a bit more about modeling. So I can select an edge and then I get the little XYZ gizmo. So um, have I shown you the shortcut to change the icon here before? Maybe a shortcut to change this um, uh, gizmo to XYZ, the shortcut is space. So if you press space, you can see it'll change to red, green, and blue. So remember red, green, and blue is XYZ. So red is X. Green is Y and blue is Z. Easy to remember because red, green, and blue, of course, are the primary colors dealing with light. And uh, and again, so red, green, and blue equals X, Y, Z. If I press space again, it goes back to the original um, option where you have, again, the blue arrow. So we know now that's Z always. But then the orange arrows are not X and Y. They're now projecting from the surfaces uh, that they're aligned with. And that's really useful because then I can drag this arrow and it keeps this at the same angle, uh, which is actually really useful when you're doing modeling like this. But again, if you want to go back to XYZ space, and now I know if I drag there, I'm working on the Y axis. And of course, red is the X axis. But again, what I really want to show you is changing this away from the plane, or in other words, bring this up using the Z there. Right, so now I've got something that you could not make with the regular wall tool. That is curving away from the ground plane. Now, having said you can't make it with the wall tool, a builder can make this easily. Right, that's all straight line, so they have no problem building this. Um, well, it wouldn't be easy, but you can you can definitely um, get it made, and you can give them the dimensions, and, and you can build it. So it's a nice thing to design. If you know how, I'm sure you all do. Deconstructivist buildings, architects who came up with that that idea of uh, 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 building elements, uh, of course, understand geometry in this way, and uh, and knew when they were doing those things that looked very complicated and uh, difficult to build that it is all still buildable because uh, again the geometry is um, explainable to a builder. Uh, so again if you have lots of straight lines you'll see a lot of deconstructed buildings they don't have uh, lots of very complicated curves or if they do uh, they've worked them out in detail uh, but again it's often lots of straight lines but at different angles and this is you know a simple example of that. So again I've just lifted that edge up off the ground plane so you can of course edit edges you can also edit points so I can get the vertex on the corner there there we are okay so I can then bring that away and so now you can see as well as having the XYZ gizmo we've got the little square in between so that one that I'm hovering over hopefully you can see would do both X and Y so if I click and drag that I know that I'm moving that point backwards and forwards Left and right. I'm not moving it up or down 
Yeah. You may think, well, it's all straight lines and, uh, and that should then be buildable. But just remember, when you drag the corner of a, of a rectangular polygon, or sorry, a, a four-sided polygon, uh, that it's technically a hyperbolic surface. Right, so you can see there, that is actually a surface with a curve on it. Builders can make it, but it's much more difficult. So just be careful of that. Um, if you drag a triangular surface, so the corner of a triangular surface, if it's not in the same, or if it's moved to, I, don't, it's, I want to say a different plane, but it's not really even a different plane, but essentially if you drag the corner of a triangle somewhere else, it'll always st still be on a flat surface. But if you drag the corner of a rectangle to a different um, different value, uh, yeah, just, just think about the geometry. It, it turns out a bit differently. And again, you get these, that's what hyperbolic geometry is all about. So just watch out for that. But again, just want to show you it's possible. So again, I've got this set of surfaces now that I can finish. And again, I can go back now to the massing site, click on wall. And again, I can use any of these wall tool options. Uh, so wall types available. So maybe let's do something interesting. Let's go to brick to do this. And uh, brick work. Well, you can see he's done it in the Chichak Wing building in uh, UTS. Right, so again, that's how you can create um, more complex geometry, still just based on straight lines. Uh, but again, maybe taking it a bit further than, than normal. Uh, so then I'll finish off with the uh, what I started with, the spiral set. Oh, how can you split faces? Yeah, good point. Okay. You can't always, but it's it's uh, usually on surfaces like this, it's still possible. So I'll show you that. Okay, so under massing and site, I'm just going to click on that button that I showed you before to now hide the massing. And that way I can then just select the, uh, uh, the wall surfaces more easily. So under modify, I can go to uh, split face. And you can see then that I can select most of the surfaces of this wall but is it going to let me select the front i don't think it will yep okay so now you can see because of that geometry i can't split this face right and the reason is it's, it's that hyperbolic um geometry so this one i can pick no problem right because it's flat So what I might do, is cancel that, just so it's clear to everyone. I'm going to go back and just undo a little bit, and so where were we? So probably about here. Ah, oh, yeah, just go forward a bit. Yeah. Modeling play. Oh, void. Yeah, well, you could get something similar with void. Uh, yeah, you'd have to think about it. Yeah, you could get um, a. Yeah, because you could make an extrusion, but then to cut voids to get this, you'd have to make a triangular void for the bottom and then another one in reverse for the top. And I'd have to think about it a lot. Um, you could do it that way, for sure. But uh, it might be a bit more work and you're not really modeling directly uh, what you want, you'd have to sort of think about it um, backwards from you know what you end up with. But yeah, definitely could get something similar with voids. Uh, where you'll hit a limit though, is when you try to make the next thing I'm gonna show you with um, the spiral stair. Uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. Um, but yeah, you could you could definitely get similar things with solids and then voids. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's a very different approach. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so I'll, just, I'll just finish this one though, and then, if we go, oh, now here you can see it's disappeared, right? And that's simply because I toggled the massing and site visibility option there, show mass. I'll just click on that again to bring it back. And then again, go to wall. And now if I make it with this similar geometry where I didn't uh, change the, um, the vertex. Now look, I, don't, I want to be honest, there, there still are issues with the way these walls will join. So obviously if I'm making things like this, I'll use yes. Uh, thinner walls, right? Because thick walls will give away the um, the fact that the wall joins are not uh, not great. But with thinner walls, it's not as noticeable. 
Okay, but again, the other thing I want to show you is that now, because of the geometry being flat, I can go to um, split face, and I can choose these uh, there are these uh, diagonal surfaces. Okay, so right, so that uh, that definitely will work with split face. But yeah, it's good to be aware of that. So there are limitations with split face as to what you can um, uh, what you can select, essentially. Um, yeah. So okay. So then going on to even more complex geometry, and uh, let's have a look. So well, just maybe to come back to the voids idea. So this. I don't know, maybe it wouldn't be that difficult to create a couple of triangular voids to cut off the top and the bottom there to make something like this. But again, once I start to change the, um, the corner points, then uh, if I was to drag those to either side, that would be something that is virtually impossible to make with, um, with the, the voids uh, approach. And uh, yeah, and so then I'll go and show you the... Um, the thing that I figured out, which I was very happy with over the last couple of weeks, because uh, it was really what the, the issues that you had in class that prompted me to um, to try and take this a bit further. Okay, so this is the stair where I've used the stringer method to get the curved um, balustrade, curved solid balustrade, and it works. But again, the limitation or the problem is that if we have that on the inside as well, so I'll set that to stringer closed, which again now is set to the same balustrade type, which is called solid balustrade. So I've set that up already. And there are two options for setting that up. If you want to try this method, you can use a profile. So here I've loaded a profile that's called 100 by 1200 because it's it's that size, it's 100 mil wide, 1200 mil high, but it's just a rectangle in a profile family. Um, but I'll show you the other, maybe simpler option. So with solid balustrade, uh, so I'll just duplicate it to make a different one. You can set it to default, and that lets you type in the size. And it's a rectangular um, size that you're giving here. So I make the total depth 1200, and then the width. 100 and that would basically do the same thing okay so now what I wanted those them both to be the same so I'm now going to go back to and this is good for you to see as well to change the other support type now back to solid balustrade 2 you actually have to click browse and then choose it from up here it's just one of those things with Revit now I'm not trying to show you that those are different solid balustrade 2 and solid balustrade are going to look exactly the same even though I used a profile for one and I used uh, the settings for the other one. And you can see then the, the issue though. Maybe they will be slightly different. I'm just going to test it. So, uh, but yeah, they both have issues. So this one, you can see what the issue is. It's because, again, the nature of the geometry, the way helixes turn out, that's a much tighter radius and we end up with a different projection for that. It's effectively, it's, the, it's like a sweep. So just to prove it to you, I'll go back and change it to the other solid balustrade um, type and I want, to, I want to get the technical things right. I'm calling them types because they're not technically families. These are uh, a variation on a, a system family. So again they're called types. So I'll set that one to solid balustrade type and then this one again to the solid balustrade type just so you can see that it will be virtually the same. Might be some slight differences. Yeah so there's a little di difference there but otherwise it's still the same problem basically. And so that's what I did. I spent the last couple of weeks trying to research better ways of doing it to get more direct control over the way that balustrade turns out. And again, the only way I could get it to work was using that massing approach. And it's a good opportunity to show you some of the other great options you have with massing. So I'm going to edit type and then duplicate my stair. And that way I can then turn off the balustrades, or sorry, turn off the stringers altogether. And if I do want to go back to the one that had the um, the stringers, of course, I've got that still there because I duplicated the stair type. Okay, so I've got my plain stair with just the um, 
open risers. I've got a middle stringer. That won't be necessary in the end because we'll have the, uh, you know, we can say the string is housed in what I'm going to make now. Okay, so how do we make this thing? And that's really what I wanted to get to. Under mousing in sight again, I can go to in place mass or architecture component on in place. I choose mass. And again, it's telling me that it's got to turn on the massing visibility. That's fine. And then the name, again, I'm happy to just leave it as Mass3. So it's one of the best things that came into Revit in about 2014. I think it's been there for a while, but a lot of people uh, use Revit all the time, still don't know it's there. You have 3D splines. So with Mass, you can see you've got 2D splines. That's the first spline tool. But then the next one, spline through points, is a full 3D spline. And it's an amazing thing because normally you need to use a much more advanced modeling tool than this to get 3D splines. ARCHICAD still does not have this. So one of the big advantages of using Rabbit is that you have these, again, 3D splines. So with that, we can now make sure um, if there's a 3D snapping option, make sure that's on. But no, this one doesn't have it, so that's it. Um, okay, so then I can then click on the tips of each step and get a really nice spline that goes through all of those points. So hopefully you can see already how I'm going to make my spline. Now you might be thinking we can just extrude it. Unfortunately we can't, but I'm just going to show you we can definitely make it work. Okay, so it takes a little while, but I mean still it's less work than what the poor old builders would have to do if they have to make this thing, or the stair makers, and uh, they deal with this sort of thing all the time. It's quite hard to make in real life. Uh, it's a little bit difficult on the computer, but I can guarantee you it's a lot, lot harder when you have to curve glass like this um, for uh, the real spiral stairs. I've dealt with a lot of stair makers doing this. So, uh, so there we are. So we've got the basis of our new balustrade. And I think that's an amazing thing. For a BIM program to do that, even just that, is, is quite amazing. Um, okay, so then we want to make it so that it can be a, a surface. So a couple of little tricks here. Firstly, I want to copy it. I know someone asked a question. Sorry, just checking. No, okay, good. Okay, so to make it usable as a surface, you need to use a couple of tricks. First one is, I found that if you try to copy or move this in 3D, because it's quite difficult to snap to 3D points, in a 3D view, uh, that's not the preferred option. So the preferred option, if you need to, essentially if you want to move it or copy it up and down, it's much, much easier, and I've experimented a lot with this, um, it's much easier if you go to an elevation or a section view. So I go to east, and I can see there is my line in elevation. And so now I can copy it, or move it up and down. So I'll do that. So I'll just go to, uh, I'm going to go to copy. I want to keep the original there. So with copy, oh, now I've got the level getting in the way. How annoying. Uh, well, again, another time for a good trick. In properties, well, firstly, just so you know what I'm trying to do, I want to hide this elevation. Oh, sorry, not the elevation. I want to hide the level. I can't select it, so I can't just uh, use hide in view by selecting it or any of the shortcuts, that won't work. But what I can do is go over to the properties panel. It's on the mass properties. I can change that to the view properties just by choosing elevation east there. And now I do have the, all the view properties. I can click edit, 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 and then go to annotation categories and turn off levels. So I will do that, but I'm going to cancel and show you, just remind you of the shortcut. Maybe you might remember, VV is the shortcut for that. And you can do that anytime. You don't even need to change um, the settings in properties to bring this up. Uh, so again, under annotation categories, I can then just find levels and turn that off. And there we are. Okay, so now again, I can select that spline, click copy, click a base point, and then take it up or down. Here, in this case, I'm going down. 
and it will go straight down or straight up. You don't have to worry about it going forwards or backwards like it might in a, um, in a 3D view. So that's really helpful if you know that you want to work in, um, with vertical measurements. Uh, again, as a tip, it is much, much easier in a, um, a section or an elevation view. So again, with that spline selected, I'm going to again click copy and then uh, pick a base point and then take it up from there. And I'm going to go to uh, 1200 this time. Okay, because I'm allowing for the height of the balustrade, but also the depth going below the step. Okay, so now back to my 3D view. All right, and you can see, again, those three splines. I'm only going to use the top and the bottom now. So the first one is just for the tracing, but I'm not going to use that anymore to create my surface. And so now I'm going to go and draw a line and connect the end there. Now you've got to be careful and make sure it snaps to that point. It doesn't seem to be doing that. So I'm going to... Oh, yes, I now notice with some of these tools, you get the option for 3D snapping. So it's really important when you see that, that you tick that 3D snapping option. There we are, that's what I want. So now you can see snapping to the point there. And then I can go and snap to the point on the beginning of the spline there at the top. And then I can go to the other end. Orbit around so I can see it. And then again, go to still the line tool, make sure 3D snapping's still on, and then again, pick up the endpoint there, and the other endpoint, of course, at the top. And we're basically ready to go. We can now make the surface. Okay, so to create the surface that I need, I can then select, so I've canceled in case you missed that. So I'm not creating shapes anymore, and I can then select the bottom spline, and notice that it's already joined it for me. That's what you're trying to achieve. And that's something that's very different with the modeling tools that you might be used to when you're making extrusions and other things. You tend to get, um, well, you always get um, separate shapes. When using the massing tools, it will connect those shapes for you. And uh, you need to be aware of that. Uh, so notice that this one is not connected because I didn't draw to the ends of that spline. It's the others that are joined together by the lines uh, connecting the ends. And so then I can click create form. And instead of just extruding it, it's going to connect those surfaces. And there we are. We've got a really beautiful helix based surface. But the advantage of this method is we've got direct control over where all of those points end up. And if you think about the way you do it on the inside, again, you've got total control over the height of those points and your balustrade will turn out exactly the same on both sides, which is really what we're trying to achieve. So I'll finish the mass now and then here we go. You'll get a warning that the mass only contains mass geometry. All right, so it can't be used to compute all the massing things, but we don't care about that. We just want the surface. So again, now back to massing in sight and I'll just click the wall tool there and maybe get a thin wall or one that's not too thick, maybe even a 100 mil wall might be okay. And I'll choose finish face interior. So that it goes to the right side, pick face and there we are. So I'll guarantee you, if you have a look on all the forums and other things about Revit, there are you know at least a hundred people out there in the world trying to do this who have not been able to do it for the last five years, at least. In fact, sorry, since 2008, they've been trying. And uh, so I'll do a much better demo than this <laughs> on YouTube, but, um, but I've recorded this, so you can definitely um, look at this one as well immediately. I'll have that up later today. Uh, but yeah, hopefully that will give you lots of options for modeling once you think about all those things. And uh, yeah, sure, no problem. Yeah, no, you're welcome. So I'm yeah, really glad to show that to you. So. Um, yeah, great. Yep, no worries. That's great. Uh, would this stair comp Yes, this stair would comply. Yes, absolutely. Yep, uh, absolutely. Uh, it may be difficult to build, but the stair makers can, can definitely uh, deal with that. And yeah, so to make it comply, it only needs to have the, uh, the riser and the going dimensions that are required for spiral stairs. 
and that's all in the initial stair properties. So uh, yeah, so no problem. Um, remember with spiral stairs in, yes, so for, yeah, that's a really good point. So that's why we've got this issue. So yes, yeah, so that's a really good point about the landings. So if you have a, um, uh, in a class one building, uh, so a house in other words, uh, a spiral stair can have a 220 riser, uh, which is much higher than the normal 190. And so then often you can get away without having a landing. But in a class two to nine building, the riser height is the same as for every other stair. So in other words, 190. And so that means that the, um, uh, the stairs often do need to have landings. Uh, because uh, it's 18 stairs in a flight, no matter what, for all buildings, is the maximum. And so if you need more than 18 risers to get to your next story, then uh, even with a curved or spiral stair, you need to have a landing. And that's where you'll have the issue with the, the, the railing not turning out properly when you're using the regular um, stair and um, railing tools in Revit. Um, so yeah, so just so it's clear to continue on, you could just use the same method I've shown you to do a new spline. Oh, so not for commercial. So let me see what's this. So what did Janet say? So yeah, yeah, no, so that width there. Um, wide enough for two people. Look, a lot of these are things are conventions. So there's no requirement for that for any stair. The width is not a requirement. So if it's a, if it's a um, required exit or forms part of a required exit, then you need to comply with the requirements for fire escapes. And that means it would generally be a one meter wide stair um, minimum. And then that can become that 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 uh, minimum width can be increased depending on the occupancy. So you've got to check the um, check right through section D and section F uh, for all of those controls. But it sometimes will be wider than a meter. But that's the only requirement for the width of a stair in any building. Uh, so there is no other requirement. So this is not this would not be a required exit, even though it forms part of a. Um, uh, an exit that is required. It's technically not. It's not called a required exit. It's um, it's just an exit. And so then it's so it's not a fire isolated exit. So is what I should say. Uh, so again, technically there's no requirement for the width. But Janet's right. It's a convention that for commercial spaces, uh, depending on the occupancy, that you would design it for uh, for two people, and and make it wider. Uh, how do you build under this to make a room? Yeah, so, uh, well, that's where, I mean, Revit helps you, but it won't do all the work for you. So you really need to uh, work that out by drawing. So, so I might just save this in case it's going to crash. So, yeah, but again, Revit helps you a lot with this. So once you've modeled something like this, then um, if you look in your section view, so you often need to make several sections, and I might just use the stair that I had previously to show you that because it still uh, works the same way. So you might have drawn a stair like this and then you would make a section going right through it, uh, looking towards, uh, oh, so I'll go up the other way. So looking in the direction you want your room to be. So maybe I want to try and fit a room in under, under this part where I've got the um, beginning of the stair. Now I know because the stair is very low there that I haven't got much chance of getting a room in or any usable space under that part of the stair. So what I might do first is just rotate that whole stair around so that I've got a greater chance of getting the uh, usable space I want or the headroom under uh, the part of the stair that I can see there now. So now I can maybe just move that section up a little bit so that it's cutting through the uh, place. Yeah, so now I can go and look in that view and then essentially just measure. So you need to check the controls here. And under a stair, it should really be 2100. But in a stairwell, you're allowed to go down to two meters. Now, either way, it's not going to help me because there you can see it's only not it's just under 1976, but under the um, under the balustrade. 
it's uh, it's even less. So uh, 1919. Right, so that's not enough. So now I could then go back to my ground floor plan and maybe rotate the stair a bit further around. And then, if I look in the section view now, you can see because I've got around that I've got more headroom. And uh, so again, I can just measure from uh, a point where I want to be able to get under. And I can see there, so that's now 2300. And so then from the stringer, it's uh, about the same, a bit less uh, than that, 2200. And, uh, and so again, I can get some uh, people if they need to walk under that area, or if I want to build something under there, um, that's possible. So that's that's essentially how you need to work it out. So yeah, so that's uh, hopefully going to answer that question. It's quite difficult though. So you may see with spiral stairs, it's very very unusual to have um, uh, enclosed rooms underneath them. Very unusual, partly because the geometry is so complicated. Um, because you end up having a shape that's a helix, and hopefully you all realise now that a helix is a fairly complex piece of geometry on its own, but then when you need to connect that helix to another curve that's that's flat, or that is um, in, in yet another plane, it's very, very complicated. So the planning's difficult, the design's difficult, and often you end up with, um, again, quite unusual um, spaces under those. Uh, enclosed spaces under straight stairs are much more common, uh, but normally under spiral stairs they are uh, generally open. Uh, but you still will want to look at maybe having it as a space that people can walk under, and you can definitely check that just by making sections. So maybe if you the other way, way. Uh, we could uh, check that as well. So with another section, again, we can just get an idea then what the headroom is going to be. So essentially you check it by modeling. You make the thing that you're trying to check and then you create views and uh, and check it. And this is the way basically it was always done when it was done by hand. So let's check that. So another question. I oh, know, so it must be another meeting or something. Okay, so uh, yeah, so hopefully that makes it a bit clearer. But uh, it's one of those things you need to just um, try and then as you work with these things, you'll be able to investigate them a bit further. But you can see there, you know, 2700 under here, so we've got no problem walking under that part of the stair. But as we get to this point, then again, okay. check some of those measurements two meters there. And uh, yeah, again, quite complicated. Don't know if I've told you the story about the architect that I did a little bit of work with, he's the most famous that I ever dealt with by the name of um, Hugh Burek, the guy who did the house in Castle Crag, but a lot of other fairly well known uh, buildings in Sydney. Brilliant architect. And he did a place in Newtown that I was involved with, and um, it had a spiral stair, of course. And he spent at least two or three months working out that spiral stair. He was a brilliant architect. He was trained in Germany in the era of the Bauhaus, and it was across all of the technical things, and, and a brilliant architect as well. And it still took him a couple of months to work out this fairly simple spiral stair for a space a bit like this. And the spiral stair wasn't too different, all because he needed to have. Um, again, a set out like this where we had the opening going into the backyard, uh, let's say that was about here, and so you had to be able to walk under part of the spiral stair uh, to get through to the backyard. Uh, so it was a really important feature of the design for this house. Um, and, uh, and we needed to have a spiral, or he needed to have a spiral stair, um, so it didn't take up too much space in the plan, but to work out that headroom, again, even for this really experienced architect, took him uh, a really long time. It's quite complicated. Uh, so yeah, you just need to take your time with that and, uh, and again, just make as many views as you need to uh, to work out your head clearance and, and things like that. And then you might see why people, you know, tend to not enclose those spaces and also where they can use um, straight stairs. Um, so, uh, yeah, sure, no problem. So yeah, so let me know if you've got any other questions about that, but otherwise I might finish that video there because I think that's covered a lot of things. And then we can... Um, Again, we'll come back to the assessment questions and maybe we'll even have a little break. But then also, uh, if we get time at the end, I can go further with um, materials and, uh, and lighting, which I would definitely want to uh, cover off a bit more as well.
So unless there are any other questions about those things, uh, I might just finish that video there. If everyone's okay with that. Yep, okay, so I'll finish the video there. And uh, that's really good, so that's actually worked pretty well. An hour and 15, I think, well, that's a long video.